Good morning. How are you today? I missed you guys last week. I missed y'all. Um, man, uh, we, we took a couple days, and actually, Thursday I went, no, was it Thursday or Friday? I can't remember now. I think it was maybe Friday night. I went to Nashville and watched Kentucky play with my son Judah in Tennessee play, and they both won. Or, or no, they both won that night, and then the next night, they, uh, Tennessee beat Kentucky. And then Auburn, what is, where has Auburn come from? What in the world? They destroyed Kansas last night, or at least when I went to bed, they were killing them. Did that end like that? Was it a blowout? Did Kansas come back and win that? Somebody help me, like. Okay, Auburn won, okay. And then uh, I was driving home Saturday, and a friend of mine texted me, and he was like, hey, you should go to, uh, Zion Williamson's gonna be in Charlotte. And I was like, Okay, so I grabbed Monica Saturday on my way home and we drove to Charlotte and watched Zion play Saturday night. And uh, then we just laid out of church on Sunday. I'm sorry about that. We just, uh, we just hung out with each other and we, we came back Monday. But it was nice to, to get away for a couple of days. But man, I missed you guys. And I heard you had really good church service last week. And uh, I'm so thankful for Pastor Richard. Aren't you so thankful for him? He's <laughs> such an incredible person. And, I'm so grateful for the fact that I could, I could just, I, I actually called him Thursday maybe and said, hey, can you preach Sunday? And he said, whatever you need. And I was like, it's not like you have to study really hard. You got about 400 sermons. You <laughs> never even got to preach. So, um, but yeah, he, he was able to do that. And so I'm really thankful for that message last week. It was really, really good. Um, today, we're gonna finish up our uh, thought on the life of Moses. For the past couple of weeks, we've talked about some of the good things Moses did. Uh, today, I, I want to talk about uh, the really big mistake Moses made. And uh, I know when you look in Scripture, you think that the mistake he made was in Numbers 20. And, and the thing that he did wrong there is, is truly the, the culmination of, of a lot of things. But I, I don't think our life all of the sudden just ends up at a place. I, th I think we get there by a few decisions uh, that we've made and a few things that we didn't take care of when we should have taken care of them. And then ultimately it expresses itself in this one moment of explosion where he loses his cool and because he loses his cool, he uh, misses out on God's best for his life. And a lot of people think that because <clears throat> Moses didn't enter into the promised land, that the promised land represents heaven. But Canaan doesn't really represent heaven. Canaan, honestly, all Canaan represents is God's best for your natural life. Heaven is heaven. Canaan is not heaven. And some people are like, well, Moses, he missed out on heaven. No, Moses didn't miss out on heaven because if you look in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 17, when Jesus is transfigured, there are two people there, Elijah and Moses. So apparently, because Moses didn't enter the promised land didn't mean Moses didn't go to heaven. And so I'm, I, I came to tell you today that um, when we talk about uh, not entering into the promise or fulfilling uh, God's call in your life, we're not talking about making it to heaven. You go to heaven based on an expressed faith in Jesus Christ. What I wanna talk to you today about is God's best for your life. While you're here on earth, do you wanna maximize this opportunity? Because God is gonna give you an opportunity, but are you gonna give yourself to the opportunity that God gives you? How many of you want God's best for your life? I want a heaven to go to heaven in. I wanna experience God's best in this life, and I don't wanna miss out on things that he says belong to me in our mind. And uh, I wanna talk to you about that today. So if you have a Bible, would you go to Deuteronomy chapter 34? Deuteronomy chapter 34, and uh, we'll... Hopefully, we'll get into some things today. I've got just 26 minutes before uh, we need to start changing over for the next service, but hopefully God will give me the grace and the wisdom to jump into the things that I feel are, 
are uh, necessary for you to hear today. Deuteronomy 34, I'm gonna start verse one. The Bible says this, then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. The Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all of Naphtali and all of the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and the land from Judah as far as the Western Sea, the South and the plain of the Valley of Jericho, the city of the palm trees as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab. Isn't that powerful that uh, even, though, even though Moses didn't experience God's best for his life and he wasn't able to walk into the promise, isn't it amazing how God was so kind and gracious that he personally buried Moses, <laughs> that's powerful. Because you can fall short and God still love you. Come on, somebody. I, I just am so thankful for that. All right, I, I'm gonna go down just a few verses so I can save, save a little bit of time. Let's go down to verse 10. Watch this. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, in whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all his land, and by all the mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all of Israel. Watch this, this is something you need to catch. Moses did more than anybody in history had ever done for God, and he still missed out on God's best for his life. And I wanna to talk to you about why. But, but Moses, even the Bible says about Moses, he was the meekest man in all of the earth, but the meekest man in all of the earth lost his temper and it kept him out of God's best for his life. So let's discover why that happened and how that happened and how that impacts us today. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house. God, we're praying over these next few moments you would speak clearly to us. You would challenge us and change us for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, amen. So how could this happen? How could he do so much for God and not experience God's best for his life? You see, Whenever God talked to Moses about his purpose, about his calling, and that's what we've really been talking about, living out the calling of God on our life. Remember, Moses' uh, uh, mother uh, wasn't able to raise him. He was raised by Pharaoh's daughter, and she named him Moses, and she said, I called him Moses because I drew him out of the water. And we've been talking about how God wants to draw out the things in us that he put in us uh, while he was creating us and forming us and making us. And God has been trying through this process of calling to draw out of Moses the things that he put in Moses. Moses doesn't recognize these things very often. He's very insecure. He's got a lot of issues, but he's still leading. Isn't it an amazing thing that God allows you to lead even while you're broken? It's an amazing thing. It's, it's, it's a gracious thing that God does. But can I tell you this? Grace, it, grace is not a hall pass. It's an extension. Grace is not a hall pass. It's an extension. God, God uh, allowing you to be used while you are broken is not saying, God saying, I'm okay with your brokenness. God is just saying, I'm giving you an extension. I'm giving you some time to get this right because I need you to do what you're doing. But more important than doing what you're doing is I need you to become the person that I have called you to become. Can somebody say amen? So Moses, whenever God talked to Moses, God always talked to Moses about the promised land. He always talked to him about Canaan. He never talked to him about the wilderness. When they left Egypt and found themselves in the wilderness for an extended period of time, nobody was more surprised than Moses. God never gave him this detail in the calling. Every time God talked to him, he said, I'm taking you to Canaan. He didn't talk to him about the wilderness. But can I tell you why the wilderness happened? The wilderness didn't happen originally because of punishment. The wilderness originally happened because of protection and preparation. 
The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 13 that when they came out of Egypt, the Bible says that God, instead of taking them through the land of the Philistines, he took them by way of the desert because they were not ready for war. One verse says they were ready for battle, but they weren't ready for war. In other words, this is what God is saying. I know that you think you're ready, but I know the, I know the war that is in front of you that you're not ready for. I know you think you are ready for the thing that I've called you to do and the thing that I've asked of you, but can I tell you, if I take you that way, you're not ready for it yet. So the wilderness was not punishment. It was protection and preparation. Some of you are in a place right now where you feel like you're in a wilderness and you think God's punishing you. No, God is not punishing you. He's protecting you. Because if he let some stuff come into your life, if he let you walk into that thing that you think you deserve and that thing you think you've earned and that thing you think you are ready for, it would destroy you. And so by God allowing you to stay in the wilderness, he's actually protecting you. You might not even know it because God never told them, hey, I'm taking you this way because you're not ready for battle. See, they were prepared to fight, but God didn't take them into a fight because they weren't ready for a fight. I just wonder if there's anybody in this room who is grateful for the stuff that God saved you from that you didn't even know he saved you from. Matter of fact, I think some of the best work God does for us is stuff we don't even know he did. (laughs) So he takes them by way of the wilderness. And through all of this wilderness experience, God is trying to protect them, but he's also trying to prepare them for the promised land. But all they want to do is complain. All they want to do is whine about how great it was in Egypt and rebel against God and not believe God and not trust God and and complain to Moses. And, And through this whole thing, Moses is leading, but Moses himself is broken. And in Numbers chapter 20, you see the culmination of Moses' brokenness come into full effect when God says, hey, Moses, I want to I want to give the people water. And I want you to go to the rock and I want you to speak to the rock and water's going to flow out because this time I don't want them to see you strike the rock because I want them to know that it was me. I don't want them to think that this was you. I want them to see clearly that this was me. And Moses jumps out and he gets mad and he, 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 he looks at the people and he says, uh, am I supposed to get water for you? Am I supposed to bring water from this rock for you? And he missed the whole point of what was happening. God said, Moses, I want to get the glory from this. And Moses is taking the glory for it. And in his anger, he's so angry at the people. He's calling them rebels and he hits the rock and just, just for good purpose, he hits the rock again. And the Bible says that water started to flow. Isn't it an amazing thing that you can do the wrong thing and the right results still happen? Can I tell you something? God using you is not proof that God is pleased with you. God using you sometimes is proof that God loves the community. And what we need to make sure of is that, that I'm jumping ahead of myself because I have so little time, but what we need to make sure of is that we are not masking a problem with our gift. We are, we are not, we are not covering up the real issue with our talent because God is not interested really in what we do for him. He is interested truly in who we are becoming as we walk with him. See, truly following Jesus is not really about doing stuff for him. It's about being with him first. And what Moses didn't understand was that the call of God was not just an invitation to rescue people. It was an invitation to experience and know the presence of God in an incredible way. But he didn't take advantage of that. Moses, if you see throughout scripture, Moses goes to God and he meets with God and he has encounters with God, but they're always to get a word. They're never for his own healing. You never see Moses be like, God, I'm, I'm so sorry for my attitude. I'm so sorry for how I'm leading. I'm so sorry for how broken I am. I'm so sorry for how I responded to that situation. You constantly see Moses covering up his issue and it expresses itself very often. You remember when he, he gets the 10 commandments from God and he walks down the, the mountain and he sees them at the bottom of the mountain. They're already breaking the first command and he gets angry and he throws the tablets on the ground and he busts them up. And then God says, Moses, I want you to come back. And this time, instead of me writing them down, I want you to write them down. Isn't it amazing how what if if <laughs> if we if we fix what's really broken on the inside of us, it actually takes us less time. 
Watch, because when God wrote it down, it didn't take forever. But for Moses to write all those 10 commandments on stone, it was gonna take a minute. See, when you, when you don't fix what's really wrong with you and you keep covering it up and you keep burying it underneath all of this emotion. And, and here's the thing about emotion. You can't bury it. It's got to be healed. And Moses was good at burying stuff, right? Do you remember when Moses left Egypt when he was 40 years old? Why did he leave Egypt? Because he killed a man and he buried him in the sand. Problem is, Moses, you can bury something in the sand, but pretty soon enough wind is going to blow and it's going to reveal what you did and who you really are. And in all that time in the wilderness, he never dealt with it. He was still insecure. He still was dealing with rejection. He still was dealing with his issues because when God called him, he said, who am I? And he wasn't asking that just as a, just as a point of, of humility. He was asking that because he truly didn't know. And God was telling him, listen, it doesn't matter who you are. I'm going to be with you. It, it doesn't matter because your identity is not found in who you are. It's found in who I am. But Moses kept trying to find his identity. And see, here is the problem. You cannot pursue purpose and identity at the same time. And this is what Moses was doing. He was pursuing his calling, but he didn't know who he was the whole time. And it ended up expressing itself in a moment of anger, but it was always there hidden under the surface. Why? Because he's good at burying stuff. He's good at hiding stuff. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13 tells us something. It gives us some insight into Moses. The Bible says that Moses actually put a veil over his face because there was an encounter he had with God that was so incredible that his face was shining so beautiful and bright that the people of God, they couldn't even look on him. But he put a veil over his face because why? The, the glory, that light was fading and he didn't want people to know. See, you're not going to miss out on God's best because you're not talented enough. You're not going to miss out on God's best because you don't come to church enough. You're not going to miss out on God's best because you don't worship hard enough. You're not going to miss out on God's best because you don't pray hard enough or you don't read enough. No, you're going to miss out on God's best because you're not honest about who you are enough. It's like, was Moses not, did he not enter because he wasn't talented? No, it's, it was never about talent. And if you don't understand that, then you'll spend your whole life perfecting something that doesn't matter. You'll spend your whole life trying to get smarter and get more education and get more wisdom and get more knowledge and get more understanding and, and, and get more influence and, and, and have, a, have, have, a, have another degree and another degree and another degree. And you'll keep perfecting something that doesn't truly matter. What matters is your heart. That's why Proverbs says, guard your heart because out of it flow the issues of life. See, Moses' problem was that he was trying to find his identity in his calling. And you cannot pursue purpose and identity at the same time, or you will believe that what you do makes you who you are. I have to constantly remind myself that this, what I'm doing now, is not who I am. This is not who I am. This is a small part of, of Robbie. This is not all of me. I'm not very deep, but there's more to me than this. But if I get caught up in believing that this is the thing that defines me, then I will put all of my identity in this. And when this doesn't go well, I won't know who I am and I won't know how to function. But I have to take this broken heart this heart that has been rejected, this heart that has been abandoned, this heart that has been mistreated. See, you can't go through everything that Moses went through and it not affect you. You can't grow up not really knowing who you are and that not affect you. You can't grow up in a place where you're being raised by somebody that is not your mother and it feels like, it seems like, your parents abandoned you. And now that you've tried to identify yourself with a group of people, they reject you. They don't want you. And the guy you thought was like your grandfather or a father figure, Pharaoh, he's now chasing you down to kill you. So when you don't know who you are, when you have gone through rejection, when you have gone through a period of your life where you have been abandoned and 
been mistreated and abused and you don't understand. If you don't get that heal, then you'll think that God using you is God being like, hey, I'm good with you. You're fine. Everything's good. Just because water's flowing, we think we're still good. Just because God's using us, we think we're okay. And God said, I, I really don't care about all of the stuff you do if it doesn't come from a heart that is totally open and truly honest with me. Jesus identified it in Luke chapter 10 with Mary and Martha. Martha comes out of the kitchen and she looks at Mary on the ground at Jesus' feet and she says, goodness gracious, will you tell her to get into the kitchen and help me? There's a lot to do. And Jesus says, listen, Martha, you're worried about all the wrong things right now. Jesus is in your house. And I know you want to make him a cake, but he'd rather you sit at his feet than make him a cake. Listen, if you are broken, you need to be healed. Stop covering up your brokenness. Because what happens is it ultimately shows itself because what you truly are ultimately reveals itself. The Bible says Moses is the meekest man on earth, but no, 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 no. No, his, his meekness was actually a dysfunctional virtue. <sighs> Watch this. <laughs> man, this is really good. You see, because, because brokenness doesn't always reveal itself in immorality. Broken, very, brokenness very often reveals itself in dysfunctional virtues. Things that look admirable, but they're actually dysfunctional. Like that overcommitment. It seems, man, they're so committed. They're so dedicated. And we look at Moses and we're like, Moses is so committed. He's so dedicated to these people. No, he is a people pleaser. His father-in-law recognized it. One day his father-in-law comes in and Moses is leading hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And the Bible says that day and night, he's sitting there and he's dealing with the issues that concern them. He's just sitting there and they are bringing their issues to him all day, all night. And he's the only one judging between all of the issues of these thousands and thousands of people. His father-in-law says, hey, listen, this is too much for you. You can't do this. Why was he doing that? Because he's trying to please people. He had finally found a people, and now he's trying to please them. Oh, man. You, and you mask it. I'm just, I'm just committed. No, no, no you, it's a dysfunctional virtue. Oh, man. Sometimes like what looks admirable is really a broken heart trying to mask itself with virtue. <laughs> Moses was committed, but his commitment was going to kill him. And it eventually kept him from God's best for his life. Watch what he does. From the beginning, when he tries to jump in between the Egyptian and the Hebrew guy fighting, he jumps in trying to save the day. He ends up killing the Egyptian. It looks virtuous, but it's dysfunctional virtue. He's trying to rescue this guy, but he killed a man. It looks, oh man, what a hero. He saved, no, no, he, he murdered somebody. And, and on the outside, that looks virtuous, but it's, that's dysfunctional. If you, if, if you are in your, in your home and you're, and you're constantly trying to save everybody and everything, that looks virtuous, but that is dysfunctional. You can't save everybody and everything. There's one time the people of God are angry with Moses and they complain against God. And God says, Moses, I need you to get out of the way because I'm gonna kill everybody. And Moses says, no, Lord, please, please don't kill him. 
can I, can I, can I say that that seems very virtuous, but can I, can I suggest this to you? Maybe you should stop asking God to keep people in your life that he's trying to remove from your life. Because these same people that Moses prayed to keep are the same people that agitated Moses to the point where he missed out on the promise. You're like, I'm committed. No, no, you're dysfunctional. <laughs> you don't want to come to church and hear you're dysfunctional today. You want to hear that? You want to just, I'm virtuous. I got no moral problems. That's because brokenness doesn't always reveal itself as immorality. I'm good. I'm not cheating on my wife. I'm not stealing anything. Yeah, but you, 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 are, you, are, you are broken, <laughs> you, and you think you're virtuous. I just, man, I, I, I just, that guy, he works so hard. He puts in 80, 60, 70 hours a week. He works so hard. He's such a hard worker. Is he, is he a hard worker or is he running from something? Or is he hiding from his home? Or does he, or does he find so much identity in his work that that's what he gives so much of himself to? Because his dad told him he'd never be enough. His dad told him he wasn't good enough. He could never measure up. So now he throws himself into his work because he couldn't get an identity from his dad. He's got to get it in what he does because he doesn't know who he really is. And I'm just telling you that what sometimes seems like a virtue is actually brokenness. Numbers 12. His sister Miriam and Aaron start talking about him. God steps in and, and he literally makes Miriam contract the disease of a leper. She's got leprosy, y'all. And Moses steps in. He's like, God, please. Moses is constantly trying to save others and he's constantly trying to help others and he couldn't help himself. This baby gets it. <laughs> and I wish somebody would have, would have told me early on that what I do doesn't define me. I wish somebody would have told me early on that who he says I am. See, because, because watch this. People are like, well, no, it was, it was Moses. He was humble. No, no, Jesus was humble. But Jesus wasn't a pushover either. Jesus was the most humble person. You thought Moses was humble. Jesus is more humble. But Jesus is not just a lamb. He's a lion. And sometimes you walk around like a lamb and you never let the lion come out. See, Jesus wasn't afraid to say, oh, oh, hold up. I am the bread of life. And the Bible says that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and he didn't say anything until Pharaoh acted like he was in control of his life. And he said, oh, 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 hold up. The time for being quiet and being pushed around is over. I want you to know something. Nobody takes my life from me. I'm laying it down to myself. And when I pick it back up, it'll be because I wanted to pick it back up. You have no power over me. Some of you need to take your life back. You've been walking around with your head down, acting like you're humble. Walking around like, who am I? I'm a nobody. And that is not true humility. That is false humility that has no identity. We are Christians. We are not pushovers. We are not, we are not weak. We are not to be shoved into a corner and told to shut up. Listen, I, I, I serve the lamb, but I also serve the lion of the tribe of Judah. And sometimes the lion has to roar. And sometimes Moses just needed to stand up and say, stop it. Get off my back. Don't you know what you came from? Could have left your sorry butts in Egypt. I was minding my own business in the desert. Had a good life. I know it was just running around with some sheep, but they were smarter than you. They didn't complain as much as you. They actually went where I told them to go. 
If it were actual sheep, we would have been in the promised land 40 years ago. But I'm out here running around with you dummies for 40 years, and I'm going to miss out on myself because I didn't stand up to you. Henry Cloud says this. He said, they can be irresponsible and happy, and you can be, hap you can be responsible and miserable because you are taking responsibility for their irresponsibility. <laughs> when you overcommit, when you mask a broken part of your life with what seems to be a virtue, what you are doing is you are undervaluing yourself. See, Moses was people pleasing because he had finally found a people and now he's afraid to be alone. That's why he said, God, don't take them out because if I lose them and I lose this calling, then who am I? A lot of preachers are like, God, if I lose this microphone and I lose this title and I lose this, then who am I? God, if I lose this job and I lose this income and I lose this status and I lose this house and I lose this car and, this, and my marriage doesn't work out, then who am I? And God says, you are not what you do and you are not who you are connected to. You are who I say you are. When you refuse to deal with doesn't just... It doesn't just impact you. What you refuse to deal with doesn't just impact you. It impacts others. Watch what happened when Moses acted out of anger. God turns to Moses and Aaron. Aaron's like, Jesus, I, God, I, did, I, I didn't hit the rock. He did it. He said, no, Moses, because you and Aaron. I guess what God is saying is that what you do doesn't just impact you, it impacts everybody around you. And your refusal to get healed, your refusal to go to counseling with your wife is gonna kill your marriage. Your refusal to get help that you need is gonna destroy you. Your refusal to listen to the doctor when he says, this is gonna help you, this is gonna help. Just like a doctor who says, listen, if you don't take this, your heart is gonna stop. You need to under, this, this is the year where you stop putting a veil over a glory that is fading in your life. This is the year where you say, God, here it is. Here's all of it. I'm a mess and I need to be healed because if I don't get healed somewhere, somehow, some way, I, it's who I really am is going to get exposed. And I'm going to miss out on God's best for my life if I don't get healed of my brokenness right now, and Moses, watch this. This is, this is one of the key scriptures in the whole thing. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 11, the Bible says this. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. But his young aide, Joshua, did not leave the tent. Watch this. Moses met with God to get a word. Joshua met with God for relationship. Moses didn't have a word deficiency. He didn't have a glory deficiency. He had so much glory that his face was shining. He met with God face to face and God spoke to him as a friend talks to a friend. He didn't have a word deficiency. He didn't have a worship deficiency. He had a relationship deficiency. See, if you come to church to get your praise on, but you don't come to church to be honest about who you really are, you're gonna leave this place a little sweaty and a little drenched and a little smelly, but you won't leave changed. It's until you walk in here and you say, God, no praise is going to fix this. No dance is going to fix this. No shout is going to fix this. No message is going to fix this until I open up my heart and I say, God, here I am. Here is all of me. Have me have your way. Heal what is broken on the inside of me. Heal the dysfunction on the inside of me. Heal everything on the inside of me that is not like you. The Bible says he who conceals his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses them will find mercy. One of the first parables Jesus speaks is about the heart and he looks at his disciples disciples because they say, Jesus, we didn't understand what you were saying. He says, listen, if you don't get this, you won't get anything else. I need you to understand out of the heart flow the issues of life. You need a healthy heart. You need a healthy heart. We stand with me today. When you worship to get a word, what happens is you, like Moses, you return to the camp too soon. 
Why was Joshua able to take them in? Why, why, was, why was Joshua able to do what Moses could not do? He wasn't more talented. He was more honest. He was more open. He was more relational to God. Because when Moses would leave, Joshua would stay. When Moses would say, thank you for the word, I'll see you next week, Joshua would stay. You got anything else? Can, can we talk just a little bit longer? Can I just stay here in your presence just a little bit longer? Because there's still part of me that isn't whole. There's still part of me that isn't well yet. And I need, I need to be whole. I wonder if you throw your hands up to heaven today. Father, in Jesus' name, I'm thanking you today that the veils are coming off. That the masks are coming off. Matter of fact, one of the things you did when you died, the Bible says that the veil was rent. The veil that separated us from you was torn in half. There is, there is nothing that we have done that you look at and, and you say, my, my, my presence can't heal that. My, my power can't heal that. My, my glory can't touch that. I, I don't want a glory that just sits on me and rests on me. I want a glory that flows through me and heals me of my brokenness and makes right my attitudes. God, I want my motives to be pure. I don't want just my actions to be right because I can do the right thing and have the wrong heart. I want you to heal my broken heart. I want you to heal my motivation. I want you to heal why I do what I do. I want to be right, not from the outside in. I want to be right from the inside out. In Jesus' name, I pray. And the church shouted amen. Come on, if you want to be right from the inside out, give God some praise in this place today. I want to be right from the inside. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, we love you. If you're here today and you say, Rob, I need to give my life to Jesus. I, 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 need, I need prayer. I, I want God to touch me today. We've got people around the front who would love to meet with you, talk with you. Please don't leave this place if you feel like you need prayer. Please don't leave this place if you feel like you're not close to God. We'd love to meet you and pray with you today. God bless you. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you very, very soon. Thank you for being here.